Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, along with my sidekick, Rhonda, who is um, kind of my co-host when we do these bug talk series. And today's not directly about bugs, but it's in that same neighborhood. Hi, Rhonda. Hey, Lisa. And um, Rhonda has found... Um, someone that she's heard talk and she wanted her to come on and I could not be more honored to have with us today Nancy Lawson of the Humane Gardener. Hi Nancy. Hi thank you I'm happy to be here. We are so glad to have you here so before we jump into talking to Nancy today about what her um, gardening life and her um, let's see her passion is um, if you are new listening to us today, I just say welcome. We appreciate when you stop in and take a listen. Um, the, the Field and Garden podcast is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com, where you will just find tons of resources. Um, we have our blog over there, our sister podcast called Seed Talk, our online garden shop, and a packed library of online courses, as well as tons of videos um, on our guides. So friends, just head on over there and check it out if you haven't before. And I highly recommend that you sign up for our farm news. It shows up in your inbox normally on Wednesday afternoons at four o'clock. And it's kind of four o'clock Eastern time. And it's kind of like a front page of a newspaper. It'll have a lot of headlines and then you can choose to go in and take a peek at whatever interests you. And we'd love to put it into your inbox. So enough of all of that. Um, so Rhonda, why don't you kind of take it away and tell us how you learned or heard about Nancy and tell us what you would and maybe introduce her a little bit more if you'd like. Yeah, I heard uh, Nancy Lawson speak at the Virginia Butterfly Society in Virginia Beach, I guess probably a month or so ago um, about her book, The Humane Gardener. And um, I believe I want to say you you're in Maryland. I know that. And maybe a master gardener. Master Naturalist? Yeah, yeah, Master Gardener, Master Naturalist. I'm involved with um, Howard County Bee City. I co-chair that, so that's my local volunteering, yeah. Right, right, yeah, Bee City. And I know that uh, you started off with a typical suburban yard that maybe was devoid of life and uh, have gone about changing the way you live with uh, the creatures that are right out the back door so um, yeah what have you what have you changed in your yard to to make it more welcoming I, and I love the the chap one of the chapters in your book um the humane gardener is is your yard family friendly I just love that <laughs> that is great <laughs> well yeah yeah I, I wanted to focus on that because uh, you know there's a tendency to only kind of even if we want to garden for a wildlife include the elements that um, for animals that we can see. And so we forget about the fact that all winter long, there's, you know, baby butterflies at various stages in the leaf litter and um, native bees in the stalks and the logs and things like that. So um, yeah. And also just the fact that so many mammals too and birds need these natural materials for their nests that aren't flowers that aren't you know things we typically tend to think of as pollinator habitat or wildlife habitat so yeah that's why I included that chapter um the things that have changed here I mean it's been such a gradual process but when I first moved here I really right away didn't want all that lawn I didn't grow up with all that lawn my dad uh, was actually a plant scientist and his specialty was flowers and so he carved out big spaces in our front yard for flower beds and you know um more manicured than mine but later in life he got into native plants and he had a pollinator garden in his front yard and so um so we had two acres of lawn um dotted by Bradford pears, um, there were barberries, all these things that have been planted that are invasive <laughs> and really not helpful to wildlife. And so um, 
So I guess my first task was just to try to, I grew a lot of flowers from seed and vegetables and, and I started noticing the animals coming to them. And I started noticing, I, I had bought a pack of uh, butterfly weed uh, because I liked the color. And then I realized that there were monarch caterpillars on it, um, which I didn't know would happen at that time. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of learned from, as I went from the animals who were visiting and, and the way that they were interacting with the plants. And now we have no lawn. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, and that's that, and that's that. Um, how how do you make it uh, not look messy? You have tidy edges, or I, I think you, you were saying you have like a maybe a totem of all the signs that make it acceptable to be messy. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we and I I did have those signs posted kind of randomly in different places, and it that was messy in itself a little bit. So my husband had that idea. Why don't we make a like a totem of sorts. So my dad did that and he carved a little cardinal um, carving to put on the top. So I've got a bat conservation sign, um, humane backyard, a monarch way station. And um, I just got a firefly sanctuary sign. Those are new at firefly.org. Um, you can get them. And so, um, yeah. And then, like you said, just trying to have the edges either be neat or have a walkway along the front because we've got a lot of people walking their dogs. And then I have little sedges and I try to put native flowers along there too. I try to make everything native, but I, it's, you know, I also this year had some little zinnias, things like that, things that people recognize. Um, and so it gives that, yeah, perimeter and that framework to the rest of your garden, which is that cues to care concept that Joan Nussauer, the landscape architect came up with in the nineties. And um, yeah, sometimes it works. I mean, we get a lot of questions and compliments when people walk by. And my favorite moment was when, um, I couldn't believe this, uh, a, uh, our new next door neighbor walked by and said, why aren't I seeing, why, why am I not seeing more chickadees? I love chickadees and chickadees is what Doug Tallamy talks about all the mm -hmm. time. The, right. and, and, and he quantifies the fact that chickadees need like six to 9,000 caterpillars or something to raise one brood. And so I was able to, I mean, she gave me that opening. And then while we were talking, I, um, hummingbird came to our coral honeysuckle vine on the fence and she and her husband were like oh my gosh we've never seen a hummingbird I mean they're all over our yard right next door right so so it's it's you know that's fun I think there's more of that going on than I realized because I'm not always out there um, having the plants be sort of ambassadors yeah great us. opportunity ed to educate yeah 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 and, you know, I think that people just, just like maybe we don't even understand you experiencing it. And I experienced that here being on an urban farm is how we can have this little oasis, this utopia, just by planting some stuff. And right outside of our perimeter are things that are people that don't even don't even know what a cardinal or uh, some of the more common birds wherever you are in the world, you know, that you would recognize. I grew up with a bird book on our breakfast table when I was a kid. You know, my parents, they weren't birders. They didn't go out, but they had bird feeders and taught us all of that. Yeah. Um, I think that we all underestimate how easy it is to provide even in a suburban. I mean, Rhonda, look at your suburban backyard. I right. mean, um, I mean, it is just phenomenal. And, you know, Nancy, when I was looking at your website, I um, saw that you had a q and A. I I don't know what it is about bringing back the brambles. And yeah. I totally have a deep love for brambles. Um, so here where hey. I am <laughs> in the middle of the city, um, my neighbor used to be um, a 40 acre horse boarding farm and that 40 acres, which we lost three years ago to development mm -hmm. had 
hedgerows is what I call them, brambles, that were over 200 years old that divided those 40 acres into like five to eight acre paddock, you know, pastures. And it did not take me long after getting the word of what was coming to really start thinking of that the foundation of my organic based flower farm lived next door in Mm -hmm. those brambles. And we, in fact, hired a a native landscape designer who came, we walked them and we've tried to reenact over here. Um, But I cannot tell you the creatures that we lost sight of for the last two years. Well, not two years now, four years ago is when that happened. Um, And it took about two to three years for them to start coming back. We have just now got our owl raptors back, um, Mm. which were daily visitors here for years. Um, So I really appreciate what you're doing and your message um, and can't wait to get my hands on your book. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So did you have blackberries and raspberries next door? Oh, yeah. 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 The, um, The next book... Um, that I did coming out in March called Wildscape. That's where I interviewed um, Richard Broughton, who was in that Bring Back the Brambles Q and A that you that you mentioned. Okay. Um, so I did the I did the full Q and A online, but in the book I included information from him, and yeah, he did these studies. Um, in completely different sites. And one was um, near an ancient forest. And another one was in sort of an urban area that didn't have forest at all. And showed that in the former site, in the one near the woodland, those brambles were acting as these nurse plants for the seeds that the jays and the squirrels were bringing over. And then the deer couldn't get to them because the brambles made this kind of natural caging. And um, and then, but then even in the place where there wasn't a natural seed source nearby for trees, the brambles just provided this incredible habitat for bees, butterflies, birds, you know. Um, and yeah, I just don't, every time it seems like when I... I visit a property around here where people are trying to like, even like nature centers and stuff. Um, they're trying to regenerate. I, I, they, it seems like they often, the first thing they do is take out the brambles <laughs> to put in a pollinator garden or put in trees or something, because we've been so taught that these thorny things are somehow waste spaces. Yeah. And, you know, I tell you what happens here. So we have to tame them. I mean, as I do everything, because we only have three acres in the middle of the city, um, we have to make it so that we can maintain the property. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have some brambles. Oh my gosh, their stalks are huge. (laughs) You know what I mean? They're just, but I have, but we don't remove them, but we have to whack them all the time. You know, we have to prune them back. I mean, our guy that takes care of cuts what grass and it's not really grass. It's just whatever pops up. You know, he keeps the, the vegetation down where the flatlands are. He'll say, I cannot get near this part of your native border because of these whips that are coming out and right. me off my mower. <laughs> um, so I understand, but I think people think it's all or nothing, but you can yeah. definitely tame them, but you have to wear body armor to yeah. do it, for sure, yeah. you know, so maybe that would be encouraging to someone to realize you can, but it's just a little more work, but it's definitely worth it, right? Right, right. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't have to leave all of them, but leave a space for them, or leave, like you said, yeah. borders. Yeah. We actually had a, a an email this week. Um, someone wanted to put out more. She actually said bird houses, um, but they have issues with their local cats. <clears throat> so I recommended, you know, maybe talking to the neighbors, seeing if they could get bells, but also, in you know nix the bird feeders if that they were an option and really planning more habitat um you know the all those berry producing natives 
but also yeah. like like you said, yeah, the brambles are great places to hide from a cat. I would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> if you're a little bird. Yeah, yeah, definitely. you can get in in there and uh, yeah, be protected. So yeah. So how did she respond? Because I recommend. I, I haven't. That I haven't. Too. We actually have an email person who I sent my my uh, response back to her, and uh, so I haven't heard back from her yet. But yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, re I think reaching out to the neighbors is a, a, a nice thing to do to start and then, uh, yeah, yeah, see what you can do. Because um, yeah. that's one, one other thing I think you've said in your book, too, is that plants are the solution um, to so many different problems um, or or conflicts, I should say, not problems. Yeah. You know, just looking at things differently and seeing if a plant can make a difference. So. Right. Perceived problems. Right. Like, and, and brambles are another good example of that because they, um, you know, deer will eat them. They feed. Yeah. I always think if we can leave brambles and pokeweed and, and things that people tend to take out, they don't realize that those are the things that deer eat too. They're not just after your zinnias or after, after your native plants or, right. I mean, that they are after your native plants because they're native animals. But I mean, they're not just after the the ones that you that you specifically planted. They also really like these more wild plants like goldenrods and sumacs and, and things that people tend to sort of be afraid of, um, and they shouldn't be because they feed so many animals and they could take the pressure off, you know, the the, the browsing pressure off sometimes some of the other plants if you leave them. So Nancy, if somebody's listening that would really just like in a suburban situation um, or just they just need to start small, whether they've got 10 acres or not, um, yeah. what are some of the steps that you would recommend that small steps they can take? I think sometimes the steps are so simple. People just have no idea the impact that they can have. What would those recommendations be? Yeah. So. Um... I would just start with one bed of just, you know, a few species. So, or if you want to start with, you know, a, a couple of trees and put some, some um, perennials around them, you know, right away as the tree grows in. Um, yeah, I think, you know, people tend to, they'll plant a tree and then they'll leave it to grow in the grass. But what if you plant a tree and from the beginning instead of using mulch you use these native ground covers like violets and ragwort and blue mist flower and I don't know there's so many it's Virginia bluebells and sedges and um and then you know soon enough you'll have you, this place you can keep expanding upon and that's what we've done here and in the beginning, you know, I was in my late 20s or 30 when we started, so I didn't mind digging out all these patches. Um, but now I really um, like to save my energy. And so I, I use, I usually do the newspaper method. And, um, and so just killing the grass with layering newspaper and putting compost or mulch or leaves on top. And then you can plant into it pretty soon as the paper breaks down. And um, that's pretty much my whole place is built on newspaper and cardboard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's pretty simple, you know, and you don't, I mean, what's fun is that if you just get a few species at a time, like if, and if you know, if you're getting just try, starting a pollinator garden, it would be good to just actually make sure you get several at least maybe five of one plant, five of another, because then the bees can see it. Um, they need those visual and olfactory cues. Um, and so um, I think if you're I think if you're starting small though, it's amazing to see how quickly animals respond and then it gets you excited to do a little more and um, I think when people become overwhelmed is when they can't main they start an area, they can't maintain it. And it's not yeah. filled with plants enough to crowd out um, weeds that come in, invasives that come in. And so 
you know, also, I think knowing that if you're pulling a lot of invasives in one place, don't just leave it after you pull it, just get those vigorous natives in there right away, or perennials, you know, something that you that is going to hold the space because otherwise all that effort is for not <laughs> yeah i can relate to that we just started a new area or that we actually used to farm and now we put native trees in and then we got the next layer of native shrubs and then this past fall let's see this not this past fall a year ago gosh i can't believe it's been a year we are in november it was a year ago we went ahead and plugged in a lot of, you know, goldenrod and some native Rebecca's and Joe pie weed. And I was just walking back there today and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, I had forgotten how quickly the invasives can jump into a space and run when there's no comp competition, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is discouraging because my husband actually said to me, is it supposed to look like that? <laughs> exactly what he said to me. Oh no! And I said no, honey. I just need to get in there with the weed eater and very yeah. selectively get them down before they seed and try to get some get tons of leaves in there to out. You know, I mean, and anyway, yeah. we're waiting for that solidago, that goldenrod to get get pushy like it's supposed to get. Right, right, and that's another thing is reason to go slow is. Because you do need that time over the first two or three years yes. to weed that area yes. as things are growing in. And um, yeah, I mean, I know there's, you know, a lot of people will do when they're first seeding like a prairie and they'll put in the annual seeds too to cover that ground. And But there's still going to be that maintenance in the beginning. And I do have areas now that I don't have to do that hardly at all or at all because the ground covers are so thick um yes oh, that's such a delight isn't it <laughs> when you get to that point it's true I agree with you our original native border which is about 500 feet long and 20 feet wide it's now five years old and it has finally gotten pushy enough on each other that nothing really grows underneath except what we want to grow underneath, you know? Yeah. And it is quite delightful to all we have to do is, you know, mow the front edge and the back edge and then everything in between is on its own and the, the activity, the bird. And um, I understand you have a love for some short legged creatures like I do little turtles. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my gosh. And I, I just I'm so scared for them all the time because they're so vulnerable to yeah. mowing and 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 cars. But yeah, when you have these little oases, you tend to see them, you know, um, because they we have hiding places for them and yeah. food. Yeah, yeah. And I think go ahead, Rhonda. I was going to say, and they're they're light. I mean, they live a long time, and you think what they have to adapt to in just a residential neighborhood. Um, I just had a big area that was wild uh, get developed and, and you just wonder, you know, kind of like yours, Lisa, it's, you know, that that amount of space was home to a lot of creatures and how did right. they adapt and move on? So, right. well, you know, the only way I survived watching, I mean, I had a front row seat more than any other person to that residential area because we do have a larger property and because I farmed, I was outside all the time, you know, and, you know, one day it just finally took Steve, my husband to say, let's stop looking over the fence and focusing on what we're losing. And let's look on our side of the fence and yeah. be thankful and provide what we can. And that started a new day for me. I just, it's almost like there was an invisible wall beyond our property um, and I just went to work really trying to provide what they need to keep as many in my yard as I physically <laughs> yeah. The turtles um, are hard because, I mean, they travel a lot more, I think, than what we think they do. And yeah, I, I'm concerned for them too, but I, um, we just do the best we can, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, and they can live in spaces as small as two acres. So um, you know, we see, well, I haven't seen her this year. I saw, uh, 
one who was probably about four or five years old. So at that point, they're not, their shell isn't hardened yet. Um, so, but they're, you know, sort of almost medium sized. And, um, but the previous year in 2021, I saw a mom laying her eggs three times, or at least looking like maybe she didn't really lay them all those times, but she definitely um, was digging and then, you know, backing up and, um, and I'm, it's one that I've seen in previous years and I didn't realize it till I was looking at my pictures because she has a scar on her shell mm. and um, it's very distinctive. And um, so, you know, she's been making her life here for, for uh, who knows how long. I mean, it's, you know, fully grown turtle that we saw last time and like, or the last pictures I took must have been in like 2018. So, but yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's, I think the thing that makes me sad about it is that, you know, there's been those studies showing that even if you take out one or two of a population, that's going to start to doom the population. I think it's a, a number as small as that. I'd have to look back. I think that was one of Doug Tallamy's studies a long time ago. And um and so it's just because they like you said they live so long and they take so long to mature and so mm -hmm. unlike other animals with really fast reproduction yeah. rates like, like pos opossums or yeah. rabbits <laughs> right <laughs> right so, um, so although, Nancy, tell okay. us a little bit about your book the humane gardener yeah um well it's i wrote that book um in 2015 or so oh. came out in 2017 and um it is sort of uh um was my launching point i had done some social media before that but the book was really a way to kind of coalesce what I had been thinking about since I started working at the Humane Society of the U.S. Um, in 1999, which has um, a companion animal department, a farm animal department, or an urban wildlife department. And so I had been writing for years about conflicts with urban wildlife and humane solutions to conflicts. And then around the same time, I was getting involved with garden with gardening because I bought my house and um, wanted to fill it <laughs> with flowers. And um, and I it just seemed like there was not a bridge enough between you know some of the plant people, even native plant people, who who wanted to plant for the environment but got mad at animals for eating plants, and yeah. then. And then some of the animal people who really didn't focus enough, I thought, on, you know, having food for our very, our most local wildlife. You know, they tended to be like a, a focus on charismatic wildlife in other places. Polar bears. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> And so, um, and so what do they need right in your own house? You know, people might have their very beloved pets that they're taking great care of, but they might just mow their entire yard and not think about, even if they like animals, I'll think about all that's happening outside. And so that was sort of what I wanted to do was reach, reach people um, who already were maybe interested in animals and plants, but didn't think about the interactions and interrelationships. So I profiled six people around the country um, uh, to kind of show that you can do this anywhere in any kind of space, small, large, um, and with quite different plants sometimes and different, different animals uh, in your area too. Um, and yeah, so that was my, that's the main focus of that. Awesome. And yeah, you know, the, the conflicts. And then one thing I really never thought about, but I think everyone should consider 
the ri risk management. I mean, we all have to do it at work or wherever, you know, don't get up on the ladder without somebody around spotting you. But just thinking of your yard that way, all the mm. dangers that are out there from your windows that the birds hit, to netting, uh, you know, we've seen snakes get caught up in yeah. that bird netting. And yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and even this year, I, I thought, oh, great idea. Saw it somewhere, the mosquito trap, the five gallon bucket. You know, you would never put a five gallon bucket of water out there if you have a two year old. All right. I didn't even really, I, you know, the water was only this deep, but I had a, a, a rat. Oh, yeah. That yeah. got in and couldn't get out. And it's, yeah. I mean, right. the simple thing with, I can still do the bucket, but to have hardware cloth on top of it so the mosquitoes can go in there and lay right. their eggs and, um, but nothing yeah. else can go in there and die. Because like, any of those looking, vertical surfaces, right? Right, right. Or, you know, if you have a pool or a pond, you know, if something gets in there, um, they have to have a way to get out. And, you know, you just think of, yeah. So anyway, just. Yeah. It's a good way to your put yard it. and mm -hmm. what you can do to make a difference in a positive way or to avoid those awful accidents. Um, right. Like, yeah. So I like that risk management for wildlife. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's their home too. Right. Right. As think, hazard free as possible. Yeah. I think most people would be on board with that too. If they knew about it, that, right. that's that's exactly know, right. being involved in all this for so many I won't even say it, two and a half decades, holy cow. Um, you know, I still am perplexed over the number of people that just don't know about some basic stuff, you know, because that's yeah. not their wheelhouse. It seems very obvious to me and you and Rhonda, yeah. you know, because that's, we're there. We love it. It's our passion. And, um, but yeah, so that's, that's a great point, Rhonda. That's a great point. Yeah. I think the marketing, all the marketing supersedes kind of what normally would be people's intuition or common sense, you know, um, there's so much marketing about what the perfect house should look like when you sell it. And, um, oh, yeah. you know, the focus on these things is so, so, so overrides um, just paying a little more attention to the fact that there are other beings out there and, right. and, and I think of it like, like, yeah, who are the low hanging fruit? You know, who are the people, like you just said, who actually care and would want to help with these things? And I feel like that's a huge number that we still yeah. have to reach. Yeah. So I don't never even, ends. It never yeah. ends. Never. I, I think it has changed a lot in the last, you know, 20 years. You know, people planting pollinator gardens or uh, monarch, you know, monarchs. And, but it's that, you know, all those other creatures out there that are doing their part in the ecosystem that deserve our love too, or at least a little attention. I mean, I just recently yeah. heard about, I don't know if it was you or someone else that a fly garden or a wasp garden mm -hmm. um, where you plant those things. I mean, it can be in just one big garden. Uh, you have the little flowers, the big flowers, the, you know, the honeysuckle and everybody's welcome. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, that is a great idea. Well, Nancy, we really appreciate you coming and chit-chatting with us and um, kind of turning us back onto brambles too. <laughs> I mean, I'll look twice before I cut again, you know? I mean, we, we have tons of brambles on our property um, and I'll take a better special look at them. I knew they were important, but I'll um, maybe move them a little bit up the ladder. <laughs> Do you have any closing remarks, Rhonda, that you want to add? No, I'm just, I'm just glad she, she stopped by to visit, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing your new book. Thank you. Yeah, it was yeah. good talking with you guys. So, what's the name of your new book, Nancy? That's coming out. Okay, so I have to look at it because it has a very long subtitle. Wildscape is the title, and the subtitle is Trilling Chipmunks, Beckoning Blooms, Salty Butterflies and other sensory wonders of nature. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And will that be available when? March, March I believe 28th. Okay. 
Awesome. So people can look for that. And Rhonda, we should put a link to that and her other Whoops. book. Yes. There you go. Whoops, sorry. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we just appreciate people like you, Nancy, that are out there, you know, just raising the flag for those that can't. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys too. So we're all in this we're all together. Listening. We're all hungry for it. And um, we just hope to reach a few more people. So friends, you can check out Nancy's book that's been out for a while but that does not mean it is not relevant to you the humane gardener um and then she has a new one coming out in march so keep your eyes peeled for nancy all right nancy are you active on social media yes it's so uh, tell people how they can connect with you yeah under humane gardener so uh facebook um is where i'm most active um facebook.com slash humane gardener and Instagram at Human Gardener. Great. Yeah. And I have a website, humangardener.com, that I'm very responsive to the contact form there too. And so that's H U M A N E G A R D E N E R.com. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. All right, friends. Until we meet again, thanks again for stopping by for Lisa and Rhonda on Bug Talk. <laughs> talking about hmm, maybe where bugs live today, right? All right, friends. Ciao.